So uh, I work at Engine Yard. Uh, my, my name is Shai. I'm not really shy, although that, I always get that when I introduce myself. So my, uh, my Twitter is Guitar. You can reach me there, my general internet handle. So start off by reading this tweet that I, uh, I liked a lot. Not having an API in 2012 is like not having a website in 1998. And I feel like the state of the industry that we are in right now, where you know, all these marketing buzzwords like software as a service and platform as a service and infrastructure as a service, and my roommate actually was interacting with Razors as a service, um, all this stuff basically are code words for having an API, right? Like as a service is have a product that has an API. And even more than that, you know, there's all this talk about having this big monolithic app and splitting it up into a distributed service-oriented architecture. And this stuff, all these different systems interact with APIs, right? So this stuff is super important. <coughs> um, and I want to focus on how we test these APIs. So specifically, I'm going to be talking about how we test server-client APIs. And I'm going to talk about the scenario where we have control both over the server and the client. There's going to be other scenarios that you'll run into, but this is what I'm going to focus on. And I'm going to focus on the nature of having a server and a client, developing them both together with JSON as the HTTP endpoint. So this is my guitar. And I, I play music. I have a band I play with on the weekends. I love playing music. Uh, that really is my guitar. And the reason I'm telling you this is to set the context for the story of developing this API, it's going to be underneath a music labeling company. So when I say we, I'm going to be referring to this, this company, right? So I want to introduce the characters. We're going to have a uh, server developer. We're going to have a client library developer that's going to develop a client that's going to consume that API. And then there's going to be an app developer that's going to be consuming that library to interact with the API. It's not going to be part of the company, but he's going to use that product, right? And so we're basically gonna, the server is basically going to have two endpoints. We're going to have a POST and a GET uh, HTTP endpoint. It's going to be a simple REST interface. You're going to have slash songs, and you're going to post the words and the title of the song. And that's going to be our domain model. We're just going to have uh, a title and name, uh, the name basically and words. And we're going to have a GET endpoint where we're going to retrieve the words for that song if we pass that title. And in this context, I'm going to assume that the titles are going to be unique, so you can't post uh, another song if you've already posted that with that title. And the client will look something like this, essentially, which is we're going to have we're going to instantiate a new object, a client object. We're going to have a post song and a get song method, and those things are going to interact with that REST API that we created. And you know, you pass the title and you get the words back. Right? Pretty simple. And we want to make it easy for consumer applications to use that library and in the test just have it really work really quickly and nice and, and be reliable. So just a quick question for the audience. Who here has used Fog by any chance? OK, great. Are you guys, that's, that's awesome, yeah. Uh, have you guys used uh, Fog's mocking interface? Uh, how many people? OK, not, not quite as, as many as actually use Fog. But essentially, Fog has a really cool uh, backend where you can just do fog.mock. And you're basically interacting with Amazon's API, but everything's happening super quick. It's everything's happening in memory. And it just works. And it's, it's super awesome. There's other gems, too, that work like this, like the, the yeah, there's, there's a bunch. But um, yeah, so we want to create this client so that it has this kind of mocking interface so that you can actually interact with it in a third-party app, and it just works, right? And it's fast. So just to reiterate the plans, we want to create an API that musicians can use to store songs. We want to build a client library that can be used in consumer applications. And we want to make it easy for those applications to test with that library. OK, so how do we, how do we actually test these things, these beasts, right? So count the ways. Uh, I've, I've been, I basically interact with APIs on a daily basis. I, I'm either writing an API or talking to an API. I'm doing this all the time. And I'm going to run through some approaches that I've, that I've personally encountered. Um, isolated approach, sandbox approach, fake servers, and mappers. And I don't know if any of these names you'd recognize because they're names that I made up. But um, yeah, that's, that's what I'm going to run through. So, <laughs> so the, first, the first kind of thing that you do when, you have, when you're in this situation where you want to develop a server and a client 
is you're going to test the server and you're going to test the client, and you don't really think about, okay, how am I going to create like, this good integration path to test everything? I'm just going to test the server and I'm just going to test the client. And you'll end up, you basically have something like this where the server, for a really you know, simplified demonstration purpose, you would have this post, right? You'd have like a create method where you would basically take in the parameters of the, the title stored in the database and then you know, return some JSON saying that you, you, know, you got it, you got it okay. I mean, we could make this a little more restful by you know, having the right status code and stuff like that, but this is trying to really simplify it here. And then we would have that post, oh, I'm sorry, that would be the post, and then we would have this get uh, endpoint where we would do the same thing, right? And we would basically get the name parameter, get the song from the database, render back, JSON, render the words back, and that would be how our server looks like. And the way that our test would look like would be essentially using, this is using test unit, and we would essentially use something like rack test, um, talk to that you know, endpoint, make sure that uh, the behavior of the server is what we expect it. We get the words back if we post those words initially with, you know, with, that, with that same uh, REST interface. And then the client would look similar to, the, similar to the server. We would have that get song, which talks to that get REST endpoint. Um, and then we would parse that JSON we got back, get the words, and that, that's what the client would look like, right? And in the test, we would do the same thing. We would assert that we post the song with a specific knit title and words, and then we assert that we get that back, right? And we get the same words back. All nice and dandy so far, except for the setup for the client, we're going to actually need to mock out the server, right? Because we're not, we're not actually talking to the server, we're mocking it out. And we could use uh, web mock, which is different talks have referred to that. Um, I think it's pretty famous. Fake web is pretty famous. But all these things essentially are doing the, the one thing that is, you will see, not so great because we're mocking out the server. We don't actually know that if the server changes, the client tests are going to pass because we've mocked out the server, but essentially it's green and it's not working. Right? And this, these are non-representative tests. It's, it's not a good scenario. Right? Like, what could end up happening is they, the server guy completes his work, the client guy completes his work, they ship it off, and this musician tries to interact with the client. The server guy changes something in the back end, and then the client breaks, but the client developer doesn't know that anything happened because his test still passed. He gets a call back from the musician guy, and he's like, starting yelling at him like, oh, you know, my business is down, what's going on, blah, 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 and he gets really sad, right? <laughs> so that's, that's no good. Um, and so instead of relying on mocking it out, let's say, okay, well, let's actually put, a, put up a real server somewhere, call it a sandbox, and we're going to actually run those client tests against the sandbox, right? And so that way we can have this full representation of what's happening, and we know that, that uh, the client tests are actually talking to the real server. And the server development is still the same, but we're actually talking to the server, and this is good, right? Um, we would essentially set a domain in the, in the tests and do the same assertions that we decided to do beforehand. We would assert we get the words back if we use that client interface. And we're basically talking to that sandbox, and we actually get the words back from the real server that we're talking to, right? And this is good. Because if the server API changes, the client tests are going to break. This is good, right? This is good integration. So there's a few problems with this, and that is that setting up a sandbox takes time, right? You can use things like Heroku, and you can use things like Engine Yard, and you can even set up your, your server locally and, and run it against that, but this takes time, and it kind of steps in your way. It's, it's, not, it's not an ideal thing. Um, and also, you need to make sure that the server that you're running against has the latest release, right? This is not a big deal. You can automate this, but it's still annoying, right? You don't have this quick feedback you know, iteration, writing your test, and, and getting everything back. But what's really annoying here is that you're actually, because this is a good kind of integration test, right, you're doing the whole thing, it takes a lot of time because you're traversing, like, the whole network stack, you're talking, you're, pars you're doing JSON, you're parsing it, you're sending it back, you're doing everything, which is good, but it's slow. And when you're writing tests uh, and you want to actually develop the client, you know, you, it's not fast. And the good tests are fast, right? You want to actually have this quick feedback and iteration that you work on, and that's not good. Um, even worse is that, you know, considering our scenario where we basically have unique titles, if you're going to run the client test once, you're going to post a song, 
you get back the words, and then you're gonna change something in the client, you run the same exact test, and the server didn't even change, but you're gonna get a validation error that says, oh, that song's been created, the test fails, right? And that's essentially, you're gonna have all these server-side validations, and you basically can't control the state of the sandbox, right? Because you don't have complete control of what's going on, you're gonna run into, into issues like this. Yeah, you're going to run into uh, conflicts. Um, also, you can run into issues where if you want to have more complicated tests, you're going to have really complicated setup and teardown methods that can take time. Like, what if we want to test that a user has a 50 song limit and can't post more than 50 songs, right? You're going to need to create 50 songs and then destroy 50 songs. What even happens if that API doesn't have a, a delete method, right? Like, what if you can't actually interact with the API? You could even be stuck if you're in this sandbox mode, right? This, this is less an issue if you're developing something, if you have complete control of the server, but what if you're in this like, quote unquote sandbox mode that you don't actually have control with the sandbox? What if you're writing a client for this third party you know, app, right? You're gonna be stuck. So that's no good. And so these guys are obviously not happy about it. <laughs> um, and to touch back to the third goal that I'd, I'd mentioned in the beginning is that there was, we have no concept of any mocking mode of anything, right? We're not, I mean, if, if the client wants to actually, meaning the third-party app developer wants to use this client, he's going to either have to mock out the client in his own app, or he's going to have to use a sandbox, and he's going to run into the same exact issues that, that we run into, right, as the company that I've explained beforehand. So he's, he's obviously not happy either. <laughs> but um, it is worth mentioning that this is lesser evil than mocking out it entirely, right? Because you're actually talking to the real server, you do have... a representative test, you're, you're doing the whole thing, you're traversing the whole stack, and this is good, right? There's, there's drawbacks that you need to be aware of, but it is a lot better than, than kind of this isolation mode, right? And it's, it's worth noting. And it's even more so worth noting that like sometimes you're gonna be stuck in this, in this situation, right? Like for example, if you're developing against some, some other service that you need to develop against. So the, the next kind of approach that builds on that is to say, okay, well, this is, we're all, we're doing this kind of Thing where we're talking to a real server and it takes a lot of time, what if we just create a fake server and test against that? And you'll see um, what this basically does is we're going to create a fake server in the client and we're going to have this, this, the server do what the server does and the client mimics that, right? The fake server mimics that. And what's important to notice here is that it's in the client and that the server has all this logic, right? It's doing background jobs, it's doing analytics, it's talking to some other service, it's doing a bunch of stuff, and our fake server, all we want it to do is to mimic the behavior of the real API. We want it to quack the same quack, right? We want it to, to basically, if I pass it a title and I give it words, I want it to store something, and if I you know, want to retrieve it back, I want it to give me the same words back, and that's the only thing we care about. We don't care about anything that's done inside of the server, we just want it to look the same from the outside, right? Let's go into a little bit more detail here. To say, okay, we'll probably use something like Sinatra, and what, what's kind of nice to note here is that we're going to use an in-memory hash where we're going to store the songs. And what's cool is that we don't actually have to do any complicated thing, right? We're just going to use something in-memory that's going to be super fast and super simple. And we're going to just do the same behavior, right? We're going to render that, that JSON back, and then we're going to render the words if you, if you get it. And what's important to note here is that we want it to be super simple, right? We don't... We don't this is, this is the simplest possible thing that we can do to make something that behaves like the API. We don't actually want to create another server. We want to have something that works really quickly and is simple. So the, the most simple that you can make it is, is the goal. And so using something like Sinatra is great for APIs. And I think actually um, yeah, some of the stuff that I'll talk to might touch back into something that I think Brandon is, the, the, is that your name? Um, yeah, so that he was talking about GitHub using Sinatra, and Engineer uses a lot of Sinatra for APIs too. It's, it's an interesting concept, and I think some of the things that I'm talking here relate to that. But um, essentially, we're going to use Sinatra to, to keep it as simple as we can and do something in memory so it's quick, right? And this is the real important part to, to notice about this kind of mode of development, is that when we develop the client locally, we're going to test that client against the fake server, and we're going to have everything happen in memory. It's going to be super quick, super fast, which is great. But when we push it to the CI server, we're going to run it, you know, this, whatever your Jenkins or your whatever it is, um, 
we're going to run against the real server that's going to take, whatever, 15 minutes, it's going to take half an hour, it's going to take an hour and a half. We literally have a project that, that um, we're running client tests, or basically an app using a client, against a sandbox, against that we, something that we need, we, can't, we don't have access to, and it literally takes an hour and a half, right? So the sandbox mode, which is what I was talking about beforehand, is essentially, it takes a long time, right? And that's the drawbacks. And so in the CI mode, we can say we're going to push it to the CI, and we don't mind waiting that time, because when we're developing locally, we're still doing it super quick, right? And so we basically use an environment variable where we say, OK, if you're in this mock mode, then do it you know, against the fake server. And if you're in real mode, run it against the, the real server. So what's really cool about this is that by doing this, you're actually not just gaining the benefit of developing really quick, but you're getting the confidence that you know that that fake server that you just created is actually really quacking the same quacks that the real server is, because both your tests are green. Right? When you develop locally, your tests are going to be green. When you push it to CI, it's going to be green as well. And so what ends up happening is that that fake server that you created, you know, is exactly like your real API. right? And so if you actually use that fake server in other contexts, in, other, in a different context, you know that that is exactly like your real thing. And that's, that's super cool. That's actually pretty amazing if you think about it for a second. Because it's completely fake, and it's actually doing exactly what you think it's doing. And you, and you have the confidence that you, it's doing what you think it's doing. And what you could do is you could use this, because you know it's actually doing the right thing, you could use this as your mocked mode. You can say, I'm going to, because I know that this is a valid API, or the behavior of what this is doing is valid, I'm going to use this as a mock mode, and I can ship it with a client and give it to people to use to say, when I actually post a song, right, this is in some third-party app that's using this client, he's going to do client.mock, and what's actually happening is he's going to you know, do all this, put in the words in the field in this other completely different place. He's going to use our client to interact with what's happening in the back end, but actually it's just hitting that fake hash, right? It's just hitting that in-memory hash. And what's cool is that even though this is happening and it's running against something fake, it's actually confirmed to be exactly what's running on the server because we've run it twice. We've run it in the, in the CI mode and we've run it locally and both of the times it's green, right? Whether it's mocked or not. So I want to actually say that I lied a little bit because in sandbox mode, you do have a way that you could create something like a mock mode. And this is something that a, a coworker of mine um, has been working on recently called Cistern. And it's basically taking a lot of the logic from Fog. And instead of creating a fake application, you mimic the responses that the API returns. And Cistern gives you a, basically a framework for writing client code where you can kind of just do this. And if you guys are not aware of Cistern, which I assume you're not because it's pretty new, um, you, should, you should definitely check it out. Um, there's not a lot of documentation, but the code is pretty straightforward. And there's some gems using it where you could check out. So uh, the app developer obviously has this mock mode that he can interact with, and that's cool, right? So he's, he's kind of happy that he can use this, and he has the confidence that he's using this fake representation of the API, and it works, and that's cool. Server developer guy is always happy, because he has the least amount of work to do, really. <laughs> uh, the one thing to note about this approach is that it, it's a little more cumbersome because you need to, because you're writing two APIs, you need to maintain both of them, right? So if you want to make a server-side change, you're going to need to actually maintain that in the fake application, right? And so the server guy and the client guy has to maintain that fake application, so he has a little bit more work he has to do. Um, yeah, so, so essentially the, the next kind of approach to that is something that I call the, or we call the, the mapper style. This is something that I've only seen happen at Engine Yard. Um, I don't actually necessarily think that this is something that should go into production. But it's an interesting kind of thought experience. Um, we have used it, and it does work. But there are, there are certain drawbacks, I mean, downsides. Um, and it's a little convoluted. The idea here is to say, OK, we're going to have the fake application. We have the real application. And both of those have API endpoints. What if we just share more code and say, we're only going to have one place where we have API definitions. And we're just going to map out the implementation. We're going to say, this is in fake mode. This is in real mode. We're going to create some module that has those behaviors but we're only going to have the API definitions in one place. Right? So we'll create one repository that holds the post, and go de the post and get definitions. We'll have a client interface, and we'll have the fake mapper, which is that fake implementation of what's happening all in one repository. 
And those uh, modules basically map between, OK, are we in real mode or are we in fake mode? So the, the repository would look kind of like this, right? Simplified, where we would have this one place where we would define this get thing. And then we have this get song method that is defined on server.mapper. And server.mapper is essentially going to be that implementation. Are we in real mode or are we in fake mode? And in our Rails application, we'll basically have this module somewhere where we do all this internal logic, right? We could check, the, we could check to see that the user has some song limit. We can do background jobs and analytics and whatever we want in this kind of real mode implementation. And in the fake, we'll basically have the same idea of the fake app. We'll have an in-memory hash, and we have the same methods that we define. And we, what we end up doing is use that one repository where we have those API endpoints that we've defined, and we mount them using Rack, because you can mount Rack applications on top of each other. We'll use that to put it in our Rails application. So we could essentially just do, OK, server.mapper equals our real implementation and mount it in this path. And then what ends up happening is that when you do you know, slash API slash get song, you're going to have those endpoints that you're talking to, right? And so this is pretty cool. They're just always happy. <laughs> um, and consumer applications can still use this kind of fake idea, right? They can still use this fake mode, the fake implementation, which is essentially doing the very same thing, right? It's doing server.mapper equals the fake implementation and then run it, and then what ends up happening is they can use their test to run, and they'll basically run against this in-memory hash. Same exact idea like the fake thing, right? And so we can have fixtures, and we have this mock mode that we can ship, which is cool, and this guy's happy. It's a nice smile, I think, too. <laughs> um, so yeah, we have full integration, and there's just, it's a little bit more dry. This approach is a little more dry, right? Um, so the, the issue here is that you need specific libraries to do this, namely Faraday and Rack Client are two good HTTP client libraries that enable you to redirect traffic to Rack applications. So what ends up happening is that you can say, if you're going to this, this domain, instead of actually using NetHttp, use this Rack app. Um, and those are the only two, I think, that can do it. And so this specific, this specific approach requires one of those two. But what's a little more annoying is that when I started and I saw this pattern in some of engineer systems, it was, it was really confusing. I did not understand what was going on. I look for the specific URL in the Rails app, and I can't find it. And it's in it's some cl completely different repository. You have to start digging through all this code and understanding it. And if you don't really understand the concepts of what's going on, it's, it's confusing, right? And it can be hard to maintain. So this is a tech talk, so I put a cat in there. And maybe this is the way your brain is responding, maybe not, hopefully not, because there's a lot of information, a lot of ground I covered, so uh, I hope that, that this has been useful. But I'm going to run through some conclusions, though. Uh, APIs are the foundation of distributed systems, right? This is, this is the origin of my tweet, why I think this is a really important thing to kind of grasp, right? And it's an it's interesting thing to do because, like you've seen, there's a lot of different ways you can approach this, and each has drawbacks, and each has problems, and some of it is good, some of it is not. And, and quite frankly, sometimes you'll be stuck in a certain approach, too. You won't really have the leverage to do things. I was talking in a mode where we were developing server and the client, but sometimes you'll be stuck just developing this, the client. Sometimes you'll be stuck just developing the server because your managers don't, don't want to give you time to work on a client. Sometimes you'll just be this third-party guy using a client, right? And you have to decide if you want to mock it out or if you use Sandbox or if you use a good client that has a mocking mode, things like that. So these are some of the approaches that I've seen. I'm sure there are other approaches you could use to test APIs, and I'd be super interested to hear your experience with it. It's, it's, it's a really interesting subject. I'm kind of passionate about it, and I would, I'd be super happy if you guys uh, could tell me about your experience. Um, but there's, there's one thing that I would personally like for you to take from this talk is that having this notion of this validated fake representation of your API is great for local client development, and it's also great for using it in some third-party app that uses that client, right? It's, it's just useful. So I have examples of all these different approaches in this repository. I'll uh, tweet the slides when I'm done so you guys can just follow the link. Every one of those approaches has working examples and a tested mode, and you can kind of go and see what's going on code-wise. 
I'd like to say thank you to Jacob, who's been Stock Surf. Uh, we both actually were working on this add-on program that Engine Yard provides, and we ran into a lot of these things, and uh, much of this talk came out of work on that project. Some gems that I had talked about, Rack Client, Faraday, Fake Web, Real Web, Sinatra Cistern, something that you should check out. And uh, this other talk that talks about toggle, mo toggle mocks, which is very similar to what I had mentioned about this kind of like fog mock mode. So you can see that. This is just happiness, and uh, yeah, thank you.